Well, church, please turn with me in God's Word this morning to the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter 4. Uh, we are taking a break from our study through First and Second Samuel for Father's Day. And on Monday this week, uh, I delivered uh, a message to the men in our church and our men's fellowship. We had fantastic attendance at our men's fellowship, and we're going to be doing that every quarter. We look forward to that. And I spoke to the men from Proverbs chapter 1. And I know the Lord uh, really moved in some hearts and lives uh, as, we, as we looked at Proverbs 1 and the wisdom that a father prescribes to his son in the book of Proverbs. And now I want to look at Proverbs chapter 4 on Father's Day to look further into the wisdom which a father instructs his son to seek and to gain and to live by. One of the things that I believe men in our culture forget is that a man is not necessarily defined by his physical strength. Would a man who is sick or weak cease to be a man? A man in his old age, does he cease to be a man because he does not have the strength of his youth? Absolutely not. A man is primarily defined by the strength of his character, of his heart, as a man who follows after Jesus Christ. And Scripture here in Proverbs calls the person who lives for God and for the glory of God a person who has wisdom. If I could define wisdom in the book of Proverbs, it would be in this way. Wisdom is a life lived well for the Lord Jesus Christ. Wisdom is the life which is not wasted, but is lived completely for Jesus Christ and His glory. Wisdom discards the foolishness of our day. Wisdom discards all of the trinkets which entertains men's hearts and wisdom seeks after Jesus Christ and His kingdom. The wise man is the man of God. And we read in Proverbs chapter 4, a father's wisdom to his son. This is, by the way, written by King Solomon to his son, probably Rehoboam, since reference is made to him being king and Rehoboam was the king of Israel following after Solomon. He says in Proverbs 4, verse 1, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, and the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and he said to me, let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. The first thing you need to see in Solomon's instruction to his sons, and namely to his son who would one day be king of Israel, he needed to be a man of great character. He needed to be a man of godly wisdom. And so Solomon begins by giving a father's instruction to his sons and saying, first off, young men, be attentive. Pay attention to what the Word of God says so that you will gain insight, so that you will not be a fool like so many boys walking this earth but that you would be a man of God, not wasting your life, not living your life foolishly, but living your life well for what really matters, the kingdom of heaven, the glory of Jesus Christ. He says, for I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. Listen to the godly wisdom that your Father is sharing with you. It is good. These things are from the Word of God. And if you forsake My teaching, you will suffer. Verse 3, When I was a son with my father. Now notice what is happening here. Solomon is recounting how his father David taught him. When I was a son with my father, 
tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and he said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live. We see here there is a generational legacy that is passed over, passed on from the grandfather, in this case King David, to the son or the father, King Solomon, to the next generation, the son in Proverbs 4, King Rehoboam. We see that from David to Solomon to Rehoboam, it, there is this chain of fathers instructing their sons to follow after the Lord. Now certainly fathers, we must instruct our daughters as well. Proverbs 4 is simply written to a son who must be a man of God, but certainly we must instruct all of the children which God has blessed us with to follow after the Lord. The greatest responsibility that any man here today has is to be a husband and a father. If God has so blessed you with a wife, your greatest responsibility, your greatest ministry is as a husband. And if God has so blessed you with children, your second greatest ministry is to those children. You see, before I am a pastor, I am a husband and a father. And being a pastor of a church comes after my responsibilities to my wife and my children in my home. This is why Scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that you should not let a man be a pastor unless he is able to manage his own household well. Because if he does not know how to lead his own household, how could he possibly lead the church of God? You see, you must be a pastor, a shepherd of your own home. You say, God hasn't called me to be a pastor in the church. Okay, but if He's given you a wife, if He's given you children, He's called you to be a pastor of your home. And you must lead well. And so He says, Solomon says to his son, My father taught me these things, and now I'm passing them on to you. My father told me, let your heart hold fast my words. Notice, don't just hear it. Don't just listen to it. Don't just let it sink into your brain, but receive it in your heart. The heart is in Scripture, not merely your emotions, your, your feelings, but your heart is the center of who you are. Your heart is your character from which you make decisions and live your life. If your heart is corrupt, your actions will follow. And if your heart seeks after the Lord, your life will be one of godliness. Your heart determines what your hands do. And so he says, let your heart hold fast my words. If you're going to live well, you must believe right and good and godly teachings. Keep my commandments and live. Notice, they are God's commandments, but the Father says they are also my commandments. Men, the only way that we could say to our children, follow my commandments, and then to teach them the commandments of God in Scripture is if we have made God commandments our own. In other words, we cannot say to our children, do as I say, not as I do. But we must say to our children, here is what Scripture says, and you see your father living out this Scripture in his daily life. Now you, son, now you, daughter, must do the same. And that is what Solomon is saying to his son here. These are God's commandments, but I have made them my own. In the same way that the Apostle Paul could call the Gospel of Jesus Christ my Gospel. Because he had made it his own, he had taken ownership of the Gospel of Jesus Christ and the teachings of God in Scripture and made them His own. He had committed His life to following the teachings of Scripture. And men, we should be able with a straight face to look our children in the eye, our children who see us in the moments that others do not see us. They see us when we are exhausted at the end of the day and tired and our patience is worn thin. We should be able to look at our children and say to them, follow my teaching, which comes from the Word of God. I've received it from Scripture and now I'm teaching it to you. Verse 5, get wisdom. 
Get insight. Do not forget. Do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Listen up, son. The first thing you need is wisdom. You need to follow God's Word in Scripture. You need to live your life well for the glory of Jesus Christ. Number two, you need insight. You need to see what really matters, what's really important. You need to think with an eternal perspective about what will matter at the end of your life. Jonathan Edwards famously said, Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. In other words, God, make me think of what will matter in the last moments of my life. And let me live for that. In Jonathan Edwards' resolutions, one of his resolutions was to always live my life in such a way that I would not regret each minute if it were my last. Think about that, man. If this were my last moment on the earth, would I regret how I spent it? I want to live each moment, each day, each week, each year well. And I don't want to waste a precious moment of the time that God has given me on this earth to teach my wife, my children, to lead my family well, and to serve Jesus Christ. Get insight. Think about what really matters. See things differently than the culture around you. Do not forget. Oh, how easy it is to see the truth and in time walk away from it and forget these truths that we read in Scripture. Do not turn away. Do do not decide later on down the road that you know better than God. That the Bible says, but I can do this. I, I don't really have to follow that part. Don't be a fool. Do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Verse 6, do not forsake her, for she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. Wisdom guards your heart and your life. Wisdom keeps you from making the same foolish mistakes that every other man makes. Verse 7, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Now, that may sound very simplistic. The beginning of wisdom is get wisdom? Well, what's being said here is is that if you want to become wise, the first thing you must do is make a decision that I want to search after God's own wisdom. I am going to live my life to follow Jesus Christ and His commands. I'm not going to waste my life chasing after the stupid things that other men chase after. I'm going to seek wisdom. And I'm going to live my life in a way that really matters. And you must make up your mind and you must settle it in your heart today that I want to be a man of wisdom. I don't want to do things the way everyone else is doing them. I will not be wooed away by my peers and those who don't know Jesus Christ or do not follow His commands. I will not give in to cultural pressure or peer pressure. I'm following Jesus Christ. I have a one-track mind and a one-track heart and my fix... My my eyes are set upon, they are fixed upon Jesus Christ in His kingdom. You see, if you're going to do anything, you've got to have a plan. Men who have no plan hit their target 100% of their time, nothing. But men who seek after God and His kingdom, the only man who is ever going to live his life well is a man who sits down and says one day, this is how I'm going to live. I'm going to strive to follow Jesus Christ and His commands. And if you don't settle it in your mind and in your heart today, you'll never do it. You must decide how you will live your life. You must have a moment at which you decide what's important and you set your foot down a path never to turn back. And so he is saying, Son, make a decision. How will you live your life? Don't put it off till tomorrow. Don't be a fool. Follow the Lord today. Set your foot down that path and never look back. And you will receive the blessings of living for the Lord the rest of your life. And you will be spared great sorrows of those who spurn God's wisdom. Get wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is get wisdom. 
And whatever you get, get insight. Verse 8, prize her, prize wisdom. Wisdom is spoken up throughout the book of Proverbs as, as if she were a woman. Prize wisdom, prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Now, wisdom here is spoken of richly riches which are highly prized, which are a beautiful crown. Wisdom is spoken of here as if it is if as if it were of great financial worth and value. A lot of men decide early in their life, I want to chase after wealth. I want to be rich. How many young men do I hear saying, I want to be this when I grow up because I want to make a lot of money. I, I want to do the thing with my life that earns the biggest paycheck. Well, listen, there's nothing wrong with earning a paycheck. But if you're living your life for money, you're going to be disappointed. It's going to let you down. It's not going to satisfy you. And at the end of your life, you're going to realize that you were wasting it chasing after something that you cannot take with you. In fact, there's a parable of a man who lived his whole life to get as rich as he possibly could. And he, he didn't trust the currency of his nation. He, he didn't want to put his, all his money behind the dollar because you know how the dollar does not hold its value. It sometimes appears as if it's not worth the paper it's printed upon. What will it be worth a hundred years from now? A fraction of what it's worth today. And so he decided... I'm going to earn as much money as I can and I'm going to buy gold because gold will keep its value. And so the man amasses gold over his lifetime and he has a storehouse of, of gold. He, he has all of the riches, millions of dollars purchased with gold. And he dies. And as he goes to walk through the gates of heaven being a follower of Jesus Christ, he goes to walk through the gates of heaven and the angel is there and he goes to look his name up in the Lamb's book of life and before letting him into heaven, the man says, before you let me into heaven, could I make one request? And the angel says, okay, what's your desire? What's your request? And he says, well, I've labored my whole life. I've amassed so much. I've worked so hard. I've put my blood and my sweat and my tears into this. I, I have this great treasure that I want to bring with me into heaven. And the angel said, well, you know, normally I don't do this sort of thing, but uh, I want to see what this treasure is you've been working your whole life for. You, you say you've poured your whole life into this, and the angel just had to know. He had to see for himself, and he said, okay, Go back and get your treasure. And then come up here and you let me see it. And maybe I'll let you into heaven with your treasure. Oh, the man was so glad that he had a chance to bring his treasure. So he goes back and he gets all the gold that he amassed in his life. And he places it in this great chest. And he, he brings it on a trailer and it's, it's so heavy. It's just pounds and pounds and pounds of gold bars. And he goes back to the gates of heaven and the angel is eagerly awaiting, intrigued, wants to see what this man's great treasure is and the man proudly opens up the chest. And the angel looks in and he says, where is it? What do you mean? It's right there. And the angel says, well, where is it? Is it under all the gold? And the man says, no, it is the gold. And the angel looks at him and he goes, you fool. We paved the streets up here with this stuff. You gave your life for asphalt? You see, the man forgot what really matters in life. And at the end of your life, your wealth will not matter. Oh, you can pass it on to your children, but it will not endure. What really matters, what's really of value, are spiritual truths, spiritual principles, the souls of your family, your friends, your loved ones, and of the people throughout this earth. You can't take money with you, but you can take the people who trust in Jesus Christ. And you have a treasure which is far greater than gold. You have the 
gospel of Jesus Christ. And you have an opportunity to teach others that gospel and to disciple them and to show them how to follow Jesus Christ. And if God has blessed you with a wife and children, your greatest ministry and the disciples which you should be making first are right in your home. Men, we will only get one chance to raise our children and we will not get it back. Every day that God gives you on this earth, you get one shot at it. And you can't go back and live that day over. And whatever mistakes you've made, you will have to live with the consequences of them. And whatever investments you make spiritually into your wife and your children and those around you, you will reap a harvest not only in this life, but in eternity. So live for what matters. Don't live your life for asphalt. But live it for spiritual riches in heaven. Prize wisdom in this way. Value wisdom. The life lived well above all else. Verse 10, Hear my son and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her for she is your life. The father is saying to his son, Son, if you do this, you will reap the benefits of it. You, you will spare yourself great sorrow and great anguish, and you will have great joy if you live your life according to the wisdom of God's Word. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. How many men are their steps hampered by the sin in their life and they are dragged down by a life that has been lived foolishly and wasted upon the things of this world? And then in verse 14, the father warns his sons about the life of the wicked and the great sorrows that come from it. Verse 14 says, Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not go in the way of evil. Avoid it and do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They know not over what they stumble. Those who don't follow the Lord Jesus Christ and His commandments, they live in darkness. It says in, in verse 18 that those who are righteous and who follow after God's commandments, they are like the light of dawn. Their path is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Life is one of greater and greater joy and brightness as I am awaiting the eternity that has been laid up for me because Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, came to this earth, paid for my sin on the cross, rose from the grave. He has purchased a heavenly home for me. One day soon, He's coming again to bring me home. And my hope and my joy and my peace is in Him. It's not in myself or anyone else or what I can do or how much I've saved. My ultimate hope, my ultimate joy, what I'm living for is Jesus Christ and His kingdom. And that grows brighter and brighter every day as I get closer and closer to that goal. But the wicked man, verse 19 says, the wicked is like, his way is like deep darkness. His life gets darker and darker and darker as his callous, corrupt heart leads him further down a deadly, sorrowful path. They do not even know over what they're stumbling. They're in the dark and they're tripping and falling over things and they can't even see the things in their life that are causing them to stumble. They're in such great darkness. They're like a blind man trying to navigate an obstacle course. It's not going to go well. And that's what happens when you spurn God's wisdom. It doesn't go well. Verse 20, the final plea of a father to his son. My son, 
Be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Oh, how I love verse 22. It says that if you follow God's wisdom, that these things are life to those who find them and they are healing to their flesh. Oh, how sin will destroy your soul, destroy your body. It will leave you in great anguish. And oh, how the teachings of God will be life, eternal life, healing to your bones, restoration to your flesh. What a joy there is. What life there is. What peace there is in following Jesus Christ. Verse 23, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. The idea of the Hebrew here in verse 23 is to guard your heart with everything you have to to fight off and to cast off anything that would come into your heart and lead you astray. Because wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also, Jesus said. Therefore, what is it, man, that you think most about? What is it that your heart prizes most? Men, we love our toys, don't we? Amen, somebody. We love our toys, and we love to hunt, and we love to fish, and we love to go to the races, and we love to just get out into God's creation, and and we love to hang out with our friends, and, and, and we love a lot of things. But we use that word love too cheaply, don't we? Because that's not love. That's just having fun. That's a hobby. And I'm not saying you can't hunt fish. I'm not saying you can't enjoy baseball or football or whatever it is you enjoy. But what is it that your heart prizes? Keep your heart with all vigilance and make sure that that thing in your life which should be a hobby hasn't become the passion of your heart. Keep your heart with all vigilance. Guard it from allowing anything to take the place of Jesus Christ. Guard your heart, men. Because whatever you dwell upon, whatever you think upon most, is what your heart is truly the most concerned about. I'll be honest with you, what my heart thinks about most, just in all honesty, is my family, my wife and my children. I think about my children and how they will grow up. I think about my sons and my daughters. What kind of men and women will they be one day? This day is the only day that I have to teach my son these things. Tomorrow he will be older, and one day he'll become a teenager and not want to hear anything I have to say, or at least so I'm told. And so, and so, I don't want to waste these opportunities. You see, that's what I have begun to think about most. Because that's what matters. Am I saying you shouldn't enjoy a few things, hunting, fishing, whatever it is throughout life? Of course you can enjoy that. Am I saying that you shouldn't save money? Of course you should save. There's wisdom in saving and having retirement and all those things. But men, those things are temporary. And those things are not secure. The only thing that is secure and certain is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus Christ, and the eternal life that you can have in Him. Verse 24, Put away from you crooked speech. Put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Don't let this world and all of its temptations and all of its desires Pull your eyes away. Look forward, man. Look to what really matters and fix your gaze upon Jesus Christ. Let your eyes look directly forward. Don't be drawn astray. Verse 26, Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Ponder the path of your feet. Think about where you were going. Think about where your life is leading. 
ponder the path of your feet. Where will I end up? Think about where you will be in one year, five years, 20 years. Think about where your life is headed. How many men I've heard say, oh, if I'd only knew this when I was a young man, the things I would have done differently, the time that I wasted, the foolish things which dragged me down, the temptations which I gave into and later regretted for the rest of my life. Ponder the path of your feet. If I do this, where will it lead me? If I go there, where will I end up? One day when I'm laying on my deathbed, am I going to be glad that I did this thing or will I regret it? Ponder the path of your feet. You will not get a second chance to live this life again. Think wisely, men, about where you're headed. You will either reap the benefits of wise decisions or you will eat the bitter fruit of your foolishness. Decide today which it will be. Verse 27, he ends by saying, Do not swerve to the right or the left. Turn away your foot from evil. Once you've decided to fix your gaze upon God and His wisdom and His kingdom, don't swerve, don't stray, don't get off the path. Guard your heart. Remember what matters. And one day, you'll reap the reward. Men, the greatest battles we face are spiritual battles. They're not financial. They're not even physical. They're spiritual battles. Fighting our own heart and our own sinful flesh and its desire to be drawn away into foolish and stupid things. We must remember what really matters and live with all we have for King Jesus. The only way you can do this is if you know Jesus. You certainly cannot have a heart that seeks after His ways unless you have a heart which seeks after Him. So the first thing is, man, have you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in Him today? Are you living for Jesus? If not, there's good news. Repent and He'll receive you. Turn from this world and turn to Him. Give your life to Jesus Christ and He will rescue you. And every day hereafter you can live for Him and what really matters. Spurn Him and you will live to regret it. And you will pay the price. Live for Him. And there will be joy. And you'll never regret it. And you'll always be glad that your life had a purpose and it mattered for things which really have a, have a meaning and a purpose beyond this life that really lasts. Jesus said, Don't lay up treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. How many men are doing that? Rather, Jesus says, you should lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What is your treasure? Who is your treasure? Your treasure should be Jesus Christ and His kingdom. Live for what really matters, men. You will not regret it. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word and the wise counsel of Scripture. Lord, I pray that our hearts for every man and woman here today would be fixed upon Jesus Christ. How the men among us here today, how weak we can be that our hearts are so easily led astray by foolish things in this world. God, fix our gaze upon Jesus, upon Your Son, upon the perfect One who died in our place and rose from the grave that we would have eternal life through faith in Him. I pray for every man here today that he would lead his home well and that he would live his life for the glory of his King, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.